They may be called the next generation, but they're the church of today. Reach, disciple, and mobilize students to share the hope of the gospel. This is the Gen Send Podcast with Shane Pruitt, Paul Wooster, and Lacey Via Sr. Friends, welcome to our fall Jensen webinar uh, with youth leaders and collegiate leaders, next gen leaders. Welcome. We're so glad uh, that you're taking, you know, an hour out of your busy day to join us. We know we'll have uh, a lot of other friends join us. In fact, we had over 450 leaders sign up for this webinar. Um, so we know some will be joining us live, and then some will be joining us uh, with the recording later, as they'll get that recording. And so, if you um, if you have friends or people that couldn't get on live, um, and they signed up, let them know that's okay. Uh, they will still get the link of the recording um, because they signed up. And so, thank you all so much for being a part of this. Uh, my name is Shane Pruitt. I serve as the National Next Gen Director for the North American Mission Board. That means I just get to help lead our teams. Um, to really equip next-gen leaders, those who are reaching middle school students, high school students, and college students uh, for the name, fame, and glory of King Jesus. I love what I get to do. I love our team. So thankful for um, so many of you that are on the front lines of reaching and mobilizing students with the gospel. In fact, I was telling a group of leaders earlier this week, uh, I don't know if you're supposed to have this much fun in ministry, but I'm having a blast. So looking forward to having some fun with you. This afternoon, as we talk about every student sent, what does it look like to reach students and mobilize students with the gospel? Hey, one um, resource I do want to tell you about from the beginning, as we're really talking about um, evangelism, is that we have a brand new resource that just launched this year, and we've already had thousands of people engage with it. And it's called Life Essentials, a Digital New Beginner's Guide for Students. So uh, Paul Wooster and I, we were getting a lot of questions of like, hey, y'all are focusing a lot on evangelism for teenagers and college students. Do y'all have a resource that's really kind of a new beginner's guide for students when we reach students with the gospel or, or in our midweek services uh, when students begin to follow Jesus? Do y'all have a new beginner's guide? So we began to think about, okay, do we write something new? Uh, do we create another booklet or pamphlet? What is it? Now, we decided to go a different way and create something completely with videos. In fact, you can check that out now if you hadn't already. You can just text the word LIFE to 888-123. That's LIFE to 888-123. What you're going to see is six short videos done by Paul and I, all eight minutes or less. And we cover six topics, such as the importance of the local church, the importance of reading the Bible, the importance of prayer, overcoming temptation, the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life, um, and how to share your testimony and the gospel with your lost friends. It's basically like a new beginner's guide you would get in a booklet, but all done in videos because we know students are more apt to maybe watch some short videos first. So you can use that from now on in your ministries. That is live. It will stay live. And so if you want to use that for events, one-on-one, -on -one, your midweek, whatever, feel free to use that. That's now a tool you can use. And in fact, um, I'm going to ask um, Anna Gage, uh, our admin, to put her email in the chat. And if you would like even a graphic to use on your screens, uh, we have that available to you as well. It just says, hey, if you've trusted Christ, text LIFE to 888-123 to get this resource. So even if you would like that free graphic, high resolution graphic to use in your ministry and at your events, we have that available to you as well. All right. Also want to introduce my good friend. He needs no introduction. It is my boy, Paul Wooster. Paul, what do you think about what's going on today, man? Oh, man, I'm so excited for this webinar. And as Shane and I and the team were discussing what we wanted to do, we really wanted to create a webinar that focused on how do we get students on the front lines of evangelism and ministry? Because really two words that have come to my mind recently as I think about this topic is one urgency. There is such an urgency to reach this generation for Christ. I work mainly with college students and this statistic is that the average college campus across North America is 5% reached with the gospel. And that means that nine out of every 10 students on our college campuses and then also our high school, I mean, that's 
shows about our, our junior high, high school campuses as well, kind of is nine out of 10 students on our college campuses, if nothing changes, they're going to live a life of bondage to sin, a life of emptiness, and an eternity separated from God in hell. And to me, that is just heartbreaking. And we need to not have a business as usual mindset anymore in our next gen ministries. I think we have to teach our students the exclusivity of the gospel, that Jesus is the only way to God. And because the exclusivity of the gospel demands urgency to share the gospel. And so when we teach that Jesus is the only way, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, our students start to understand that they can't just brush by and go by their friends that don't know Christ. They have an obligation to share and to love and to try to introduce their friends to Christ. And so I think it starts with that burden and compassion for the lost and for the people that that don't know Christ. And that starts with us. And so actually, I'm praying it during this webinar, man, God starts to touch our hearts, to burden our hearts, to burn something deep inside us that, um, man, we want to make it hard to go to hell in our communities. We want to make it hard to go to hell on our college campuses because really the problem is not with the harvest, right? The harvest is plentiful. The problem is a lack of labors. And the things we're going to talk about in this webinar is how to elevate the number of laborers in your ministry, in your student ministry. And the best laborers are students. The best people to reach a student is a student. And when you look at your crowd of students in your ministry, do you see sheep to be fed? Yes. But also, I see laborers to be raised up. We want to raise up laborers that can labor in the harvest. And the next word that comes to mind is boldness. I, I think this generation is hungry to see their leaders step up in bold faith, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the truth. But also, they're ready to step into those conversations with boldness. I think the need to reach this generation is not new strategies. I think it's new boldness. <laughs> when you think about the early church, man, in Acts 4, they were threatened with persecution. They called a prayer meeting. What did they pray for? Well, what they didn't pray for was protection. What they did pray for was boldness. And in Acts 4, 29, the whole place was shaken, and they all began speaking God's word boldly. And I think when you read the book of Acts, almost every time people are filled with the Spirit of God, they speak God's word boldly. And so my prayer for our ministries, um, Acts 5.42, is, I love in Acts 5.42, it says, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Is that the vibe of your ministry? Like every day in the temple courts and the house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Man, that is what we want to see. We want just it to be on the tip of our tongues and our students that they're just like bold. <laughs> I'm hearing about ministries, one ministry where the students got so bold, one guy stood up on the cafeteria table and invited the whole public school lunch to their youth group that night. And they started seeing a bunch of people come to that youth group and getting saved. And some of those same kids that were being bold, bold were also being literally shoved into lockers, like something out of a movie. But when, when there's boldness, there's also persecution. But Man, this is the time. There's no time for sitting back and settling. We have to go hard after the lost in our communities, but also train our students to be bold and courageous. So, man, I could go all day on this, but um, that's my little pre, <laughs> pre sermon. But one thing that Shane and I are working on is the Jensen podcast. And we've been doing it for a while now. And we've added Lacey to the mix. And Lacey brings a great perspective. She is Gen Z, so she helps keep us uh, young. <laughs> or at least she lets us know when we're acting like a bunch of 40-year-old dudes. Um, and uh, man, I love adding Lacey to the mix. And our vision for the Jensen podcast is to make it relevant to the topics that you're facing as ministry leaders. And so 
I want to just introduce uh, Lacey and Evan, um, and they're going to take us to the next stage on this webinar. Yeah, so excited to be here. I'm I'm so excited to hear from Gary. Um, I know we were supposed to have Ryan and Gary on this. Ryan actually got delayed on a flight. And so you guys are going to hear from Gary and then we're going to have a Q&A time at the end. And don't worry, Paul and Shane are a pl plethora of resources. So we can talk all day, I'm sure about this, especially because this is one of those things they're super passionate about. And we have done a couple episodes, like you said, already about this on the Jensen podcast. So even if you want to go further after this, go check that out. We have some content out there for you already. Um, but like Paul said, we're excited about this topic. We're passionate about it. We do a lot here at NAM through Jensen, all these things, because we really believe that students are the best people at reaching other students. When I was doing some research for this webinar, I actually found a research study done by a pastor in California. And he d just took his church and he did this study about uh, 2,000 people. And he found that 90, 90.3% of people responded that they learned about Christianity for the first time through a family member or a friend. 90%. Like that is mind blowing. I expected it to be high, but I don't know if I expected it to be that high. And so that just shows that really, truly, the best people at reaching other students is other students. And so we hope you guys leave here equipped and excited to train your students, to light a fire, to ignite a fire in your students. We hope you guys feel ready to do that. And Evan, I'm so excited he's here. He works with Shane. You've probably seen him if Shane has came and taught at your ministry or preached at a, at a church nearby or at your camp. Um, he's gotten to travel with him and also teaches some. And, and so Evan, I'm so excited you're here. He's going to talk to you guys a little bit about that q and a time that we're going to do at the end. Yeah, guys, so honored to be here. We're so pumped that you guys are here to join us and to serve alongside of us while we're learning about this topic. Just a little bit of logistics when it comes to the Q&A part. We're about to get ready um, and have Gary share for about 20 to 25 minutes. And during that time, if you guys have a question, something that maybe comes up, just drop that in the chat. We have none other than the Anna Gage, who's going to be funneling <laughs> the questions for us. And so if we don't hit your question, uh, feel free to, uh, Anna dropped her email, feel free to, to email it there and we can see if there's any way that we can maybe follow up with you guys in that. Um, but we're going to try to go through as many questions as we can. But yeah, like I said, feel free at any point during this entire uh, webinar to just drop your question in the chat and we'll try our hardest to get to it. Um, but without further ado, I will hand it back off to Lacey to introduce the legend, Gary. Yeah, Shane's already in the chat. I'm checking it out with the dad vibes. <laughs> He's just <laughs> repeating what we're saying. Uh, no, I love it, Shane. I think I think you're a great chat host. Oh, he's got that ring, Texas Rangers championship. I don't even know how you already got that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, if you if you're not from Texas or you are under a rock, the Rangers won the World Series, and so all Texans are getting to brag about that today. <laughs> Um, well, I'm so excited that Gary gets to be with us. Um, he is just a powerhouse. He's been so faithful for the last 20, 30 years in ministry, mobilizing, reaching the next generation. He has a passion for seeing students mobilized and just a passion for reaching college students. He served in college ministry at UT Arlington, uh, where the Rangers are going to have their awesome World Series parade this Saturday over there for 20 years um, he's also an adjunct professor currently of collegiate ministry at Southwestern, and he just truly loves this next generation. So, Gary, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited to learn from you and so thankful for your faithfulness. Wow. Well, thank you guys so much for the opportunity. I'm going to share a little bit about building evangelistic momentum in our student ministries. Uh, Herbert Locklear said, that um, evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. We can either evangelize or fossilize. And so I'm thrilled to be with next gen leaders because I can literally think of nothing better to give our lives to than helping the next generation reach the next generation for Christ. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a screen share so you can not look at my bald head the whole time that we're on this call and. Think we should be good to go now? 
Um, so I'm honored to be here. Shane and Paul are two of my ministry heroes. I think if they called and asked me to uh, cut their grass, I would have said yes to it. But um, truly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself as we jump into it. For the last 21 years, I've led a campus-based ministry, um, a student ministry in Arlington, Texas. Arlington, Texas is the home of the World Series champion Texas Rangers. We are, uh, they won the series last night. I think tomorrow is the parade. And literally from our student building um, on the UT Arlington campus, you can almost see where the parade route. So I'm sure we will be there. Uh, but my wife, Teresa, works on ministry staff with us. We have two young sons that are in college. Um, and after 21 years in my ministry, I'm actually passing off leadership to a new guy we've raised up who's incredible. Ben Murray is on this call right now. Um, but I get full time now. I get to train next gen leaders, collegiate ministry leaders, both for Texas uh, Baptist Student Ministry, which is my my ministry organization, and at Southwestern Seminary. Now, my credentials: I could write a book, a hundred and one things not to do in student ministry, because in twenty one years I've made every mistake out there. Um, and my confession to you guys is. I'm honestly not a very good evangelist. I, I'm not a great personal evangelist. So you're on this call going, great, why are we here with this guy who's not a good evangelist? Well, 11 years ago, God took a, a feeble person like me with a, with a student ministry, and he took an inward-focused ministry and helped us turn it around and start an evangelistic movement among our college students. And starting 11 years ago, we started seeing at least one student meet Christ every week, fall and spring semester, for 10 years. And that's over 500 students in that last decade we've seen come to Christ. And here's the thing. It wasn't seminary trained professionals leading them to Christ. It wasn't uh, It wasn't um, expert missionaries. It wasn't paid staff members. It was ordinary students leading students to Christ. Now, that movement took a while to start. Whenever whenever I came, we got pretty good early on at filling rooms full of students, but we weren't reaching the loss. So we learned a lot along the way. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly share, one, how our movement got started, two, some things we've learned along the way, the lessons we learned along the way, and then three, some practical strategies you can use in your student ministry to fuel evangelistic movement. So what I'll share are six principles for building evangelistic momentum, uh, six principles for building momentum. And principle number one is disciple making precedes evangelistic momentum. Uh, disciple making precedes evangelistic momentum. So early on, we got good at filling rooms. We had a few hundred students involved in our student ministry. Um, and then we became decent at student discipleship. And I think this was a prerequisite. Life on life, people who had the life of Christ in them, showing people younger in the faith how to do it. Um, so simple things like a daily walk with Jesus, like it's an evangelistic movement starts with teaching your students to spend time in God's word every day. It starts with teaching them to have a real prayer life where they keep a prayer list and they pray for lost people and they pray for needs in their life and they can go back and review it. The, uh, it starts with teaching things like scripture memory, the old school spiritual discipline. See, if they're not walking with Jesus, they won't be able to lead people to Jesus. So we, we emphasize early on life on life discipleship, not teaching from the stage how to have a quiet time, how to have a devotional life, but showing them, bringing one, two, three students at a time up close to us so they could see it. And here's a challenge, especially for you guys doing middle school and high school ministry, don't dumb it down. Have high expectations for students. One of the things that is killing the church and killing is we have low expectations for students. You know, Jesus's disciples were probably the age of some of our middle school and high schoolers when he called them to follow him. They were teenagers. Some of them might've been in their twenties. 
Um, I like to say if they can do AP math, if they can do pre-calculus, then they can study the Bible. They can memorize scripture. They can learn a gospel presentation. And sometimes we set a low bar when a lot of them are yearning for something greater. So call them up to deep discipleship, to do hard things when it comes to um, when it comes to following Jesus. So in my student ministry, we gathered a lot of students. We started doing discipleship, but we weren't reaching the lost. And I know that that's why some of you are on this call. You're here because you're not content with the status quo in your ministry. Uh, my friend Paul, who's on the call, calls it dead-end discipleship, where Christians meet with Christians to help them become more Christian. That's what we were doing. Uh, Brian Zuniga calls it recycleship, where you have discipleship without evangelism, and it's not the Great Commission. It's just reorganizing Christians. And so we don't want to be about that. We want to be about reaching the next generation. So the second step in our campus transformation was a prayer movement. Prayer always precedes evangelistic momentum. Prayer precedes evangelistic momentum. See, we think it's about what we do. Like, I need to learn a gospel presentation. We need to have a strategy. We need to get out there and do it. Here's the thing, though. We don't save people. God saves people. We don't save people. God saves people. So we, we get to share. It's a privilege to share the gospel. It's a high calling to share the gospel. We get to share, but we have to pray. Um, so what happened in our ministry is a student-driven prayer movement started. And our staff encouraged it, but really it was students who said, we're talking about lost people. We need to pray for lost people. So we set aside a little closet in our building because we're a, because we're a collegiate ministry. We have a building near the campus and a facility and students are in there Monday to Friday. So the students set aside a closet and they called it the prayer room. And we had a girl who was very pushy with a clipboard. Everybody needs a pushy person with a clipboard. And she would walk around and she would stip, stuff the clipboard into somebody's chest and say, did you sign up to pray this week? And she would sign people up to take 30 minute or one hour shifts in the prayer room, nine to five, Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week. And they'd fill that prayer room with prompts to pray for the lost on the campus to pray for the lost in their life, to pray for missionaries we had that we knew that were serving on the field, just to pray for the harvest. And so the student initiated prayer movement started not the not long after that, later that semester, we devoted a full week to prayer, 72 hours. We prayed Luke 10 2, where Jesus in Luke 10 sends out the 72 to every town and village to preach the gospel. We took our inspiration from that and said, why don't we pray around the clock during a week, Monday to Thursday, for 72 hours for revival on our campus. So that started a tradition of praying in a prayer room and of setting aside a week to pray for revival. What prayer accomplishes is yes, God answers prayers, but also when we start praying for the lost, God breaks our students' heart for the lost. Prayer transforms our heart for the loss. It makes us bolder. It makes us more brokenhearted for their eternities whenever we pray. You know, it's interesting in Pentecost. What were they doing? What were the disciples doing when fire came down from heaven and lit the early church on fire and the church was born? What were they doing in that upper room? They were praying. Prayer precedes evangelistic momentum. So lead your students to pray for the lost, and that breaks their heart for the lost. A third step, when we realized on our huge university, or maybe you've got a huge set of high schools and middle schools you minister to, there's so many lost people, we've got to make an impact. So the vision was to do the Great Commission. We want to be people who reach the lost with the gospel, form them into disciples, and set them loose to reach more people with the gospel. So the vision is Jesus's great commission to be disciples who make disciples. And we made a commitment that every time we gathered students together, we were going to repeat that vision, maybe paraphrased in one way or another, but we'd say things like, hey, the reason God put you on this campus at this point in your life is so you can bear witness to Jesus. We'd Quote, um, Acts 17, when Paul's in Athens, God chose the time and the places where people would live so that 
people might know of him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. We'd say God's made you an ambassador for Christ. He's made you a minister of reconciliation. Every time we had Christians gathered, We'd repeat that vision like a broken record over and over. So whether it's large group, you're meeting one-on-one with students. Hey, you know what? You could really impact your friends with the gospel. You've got it in you. You could do this. Whether it's teaching a Sunday school class, God put you here to point people to him. Just repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. If you say it enough times, here's the crazy thing. Students will believe it. They'll actually believe it if you repeat it enough times. And if I say it enough times, I believe it too. Step number four, you put evangelism on the calendar. Here's how the transformation happened for us. We had a couple of students who went on a summer mission project, and they shared the gospel two by two, cold turkey style on college campuses overseas. And they came back and they said, if we can do it over there, why can't we do that here? And I got to admit, I've got the same issues that my students had. I have fear of man issues. That was scary to me. Can we really be that bold? See, we had a strategy of just telling people, you know, share with your friends, cross your fingers, hope it works out. But we didn't give them practical tools and a a pathway to do it. So, but I trusted these guys and we wanted to impact the campus. So, so I said, sure, I'll commission you to do this and I'll go with you and we'll invite people to come with us. So every Friday, we just put on the calendar evangelism time. We'd go out Friday afternoon in pairs, five or six pairs of us when we got started. And we'd strike up spiritual conversations. We realized real quick, we had no clue what we were doing. It's difficult and we're awkward. We needed training. So we fell into this habit where somebody would show up and they'd bring a laptop with a YouTube video and they'd say, I found a video this week of how to share the gospel. Let's watch it together. Okay, I guess we'll try that on campus this week. And we go out and try that. We'd come back and debrief it. And how did it go? Well, it went okay. It was actually kind of awkward. The next week, somebody would show up and they would have a handout. They'd say, I found this handout on a way to share the gospel. We'd read it together, do some training, go out and share it come back and debrief it. That evolved into a weekly evangelism time where we would do training, classroom style ministry training in our ministry, sharing simple, practical tools. I'll say something about that at the end, simple, practical tools. And then because it's on the calendar, we'd, after the training, we'd go out two by two and we'd share the gospel on campus and we'd come back and we'd debrief it. Um, In their book, Breaking the Huddle, Don Everett's and Doug Schott, they describe the discipleship cycle. And all real discipleship happens this way. You hear the word of God. Then you obey the word of God. You respond actively to it. And that obedience is awesome because we've just done what God said. So we celebrate it. We debrief it. We talk through it. And that creates a hunger to do more of that. In fact, You've seen this cycle play out on mission trips. You do a little training on the mission trip. You go out and share. You come back and you tell stories at the end of the day. And people get emboldened. They get more excited. The next day, you do it again. And we said, if we can repeat that cycle in the mission field, why can't we do it on campus? So we started doing it in our ministry. Honestly, all true discipleship happens this way. Sometimes in the American church, we tend to teach a lot but we don't give people practical app venues to actually obey it. So we are the the pattern in the American church is to teach. And then we teach and we teach and we teach and we teach and we teach. And eventually say, okay, now you've learned everything there is about evangelism, go out and do it. But Jesus had an apprenticeship model where he brought people with him and he taught them. Then he modeled for them. Then he released them to go and do it. He sent the 12 to every town and village. They came back and reported. Then he taught them more. He modeled more. Then he sent the 72 out to every town and village to preach. And they came back and they reported to him. So this uh, all real discipleship happens life on life, learning, doing, celebrating, creating a hunger to have more learning, doing, celebrating. So the the way you put it on the calendar may be different, but the, the idea is, Figure out ways so you can actually go with your students to share their faith. Figure out ways that you can, maybe it's on a mission trip two or three times a year. Maybe it's at special events where you mentor them and they get to watch you share and then you get to encourage them to share. But figure out ways to put evangelism on the calendar. 
Um, it will be awkward to strike up cold conversations. Um, it will be awkward. I had a, I have a funny story about we've got a new intern in our campus ministry named Joseph. He started this year and Joseph came to Christ as a student. And then when he graduated, he became kind of a, we have an, an internship. He started internship, but, but one of his sophomore year, he went out with a friend to share his faith on Friday. And he came into our building at the end of that experience. And he came into my office and he was so dejected and frustrated, almost flustered. He couldn't get the words out. And he's like, oh man, I want, I wanted to share my faith, but it just, it went so badly. It was terrible. I stumbled over my words. I said all the wrong things. Like, Hey man, calm down. Jesus is still on the throne. It's okay. What happened? Did they get mad? He's like, no, no, no. They prayed to receive Christ, but I, but I did it so wrong. I did it. I, I and I'm like, bro, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. But here's the thing, God uses earthen vessels, jars of clay, and we think people are going to think less of me. People are going to think I'm a weirdo, but God uses awkward conversations to change lives. Um, evangelism is also like a muscle. The more we do it, the more we, the better we get at it. See it when in our ministry, when our only strategy was share with a friend, we didn't have practical tools. It's just good luck, share with a friend, share with your roommate. Well, they only have two or three friends and they only have one roommate. And so they, the, uh, the number of opportunities they had to actually practice sharing their faith was very small. But whenever we started putting on the calendar, hey, let's just go out and invite people to Bible study, invite people to church. And you could strike up spiritual conversations with them. They would get reps in. You know, the way you get good at anything is by practicing, by putting reps in. Here's what you need to know about the movement we got to see. Yes, we shared with strangers, but almost all the fruit we actually saw in evangelism wasn't with strangers. It was because students went out and they they exercised that muscle. They got stronger. They got, they overcame the fear of bringing up Jesus in a conversation. And they realized, I could bring up Jesus with my classmates. I could bring up Jesus with my coworkers. We had students leading their families to Christ because they had been challenged. They had practiced it a time or two, and they, they brought it up with family. They brought it up with um, high school friends that they ha had been out of touch with, but they go some home and see them over Christmas and they bring it up and they lead them to Jesus. So cold, com cold evangelism is a great way to practice for actually impactful relational evangelism. Get those reps in. So our weekly training became an incubator for evangelistic zeal and skill. Now the the, the takeaway for you shouldn't be, we've got to do an hour of training and an hour of evangelism. It should be to ask yourself, what can I do to take students with me so I can model for them evangelism so they can overcome the fear so they can do it too? Number five, ongoing training is essential. Ongoing training is essential. Every student movement I've seen with Momentum has a training culture. They're always talking with their students about simple, practical tools that they can learn and immediately turn around and put into practice. Um, ongoing e training is a sense students need to know how to share. They need to know when to share, like venues for sharing, where to, when and where. They need to show who to share with. So thinking through a strat, who are my friends that are lost? Which ones of them might be open? How could I bring it up? They need somebody to coach them through those things. So ongoing training is important. You can't just do evangelism training once in October and hope that it lasts for the whole year. It's got to be something you've, you're constantly investing in them. Anything we give attention to in our ministries will improve. If we give attention to fellowship, fellowship will improve. If we get attention to worship and helping them worship wholeheartedly, that'll improve. And if you give ongoing attention to witness, then witness will improve in your ministry. Um, well, what do I need to train our students on? What are the key components in evangelism training? Well, number one is a gospel presentation. Your students need to know one gospel presentation backwards and forwards. I like to 
say, focus on one presentation. It's okay for them to know several, but settle on one that's going to be your primary and you emphasize it, you talk about it, you teach it to students, then they practice it with each other. So when we do, an, we um, our one of our primaries is the three circles tool. It's a NAM tool. It's awesome. And so when we teach three circles, I'm going to stand on a whiteboard. I'm going to teach three circles. And then I'm going to um, teach it again because it can it takes about three minutes to share it. And then I'm going to give people an assignment to get with a partner and each one share with their partner. Then I'm going to ask for a brave volunteer to come up to the whiteboard and share it. And then we're going to kindly, playfully critique they're sharing, and then I'm going to share it again. Then I'm going to make them practice it again because there's something about repetition. A mistake we made is we would share eight different ways to share the gospel, and they'd remember zero. So really, in, in the, the best gospel presentation is the one you actually use. So it could be three circles. It could be the bridge to life, the Roman road. Uh, it doesn't matter which one. If it talks about Jesus was died for our sins and is alive. And if you trust his saving work, you can be forgiven. Like if it says that, then it's a good gospel presentation. So settle on one and emphasize it. A second thing that is vital is clear strategies. Um, in collegiate ministry, which is my world, strategies like gospel appointments, where you get people's contact information, like from filling out a raffle or a, an interest card, you call them and you say, hey, I'd love to tell you about um, our ministry and how you could get more involved and what we're all about. And so you get to know them and then you tell them what you're all about, which is the gospel. Um, spiritual surveys work on college campuses, two by two evangelism. One of the most powerful strategies we have is what we call oikos or influence mapping, where you just get students to think through all the different pockets of people in their life, coworkers, friends. And then they prayerfully think through which of those friends might be more closed and more open. And you help them make an impact list of five to seven people in their life who they want to pray for and build in time in their schedule to be with those people to look for a chance to share the gospel. Those are strategies students won't come up with intuitively, but if you help them, then they can they can have opportunity to share the gospel. A follow-up plan is important. Make sure they know. If somebody's interested in Jesus after a conversation, offer to read the Bible with them. That's a follow-up plan. If somebody receives Christ, offer to go through a new believer discipleship material with them. So have a follow-up plan in mind. And the number four, this was huge in our movement, the structure of a gospel presentation. A lot of, we realized we had students who knew how to share a presentation they had venues to share, but they had no idea how to just bring it up naturally in a conversation. How do I bring up spiritual things naturally in a conversation? And so it took, uh, it, we, we developed a little training we call Salty. Um, and the website at the bottom is my ministry website slash Salty, utabsm.com slash Salty, if you want to see the, the training. But Salty, we borrowed the first four letters of the acronym from Rice Brooks. He talks about the SALT method, start a conversation, ask questions, listen to answers, tell the good news. But why is yes or no, invite a response. Um, we realize it's not enough just to share the gospel. We've got to also ask people to respond. Um, so we put a why at the end of that thing. Um, but start a conversation can be as simple as, hey, I've never asked you this before, but are you religious at all? Is that something you're comfortable talking about? You just bring that up with a friend or a stranger. When we do cold conversations, I'll say, hey, I'm, I'm Gary. This is my friend Shane. We're out inviting people to a Bible study on campus. Have you ever thought about joining a Bible study? Is that something interesting to you or not? You've just started a cold conversation. If it's uh, at a ministry event, it's really easy. Hey, uh, nice to meet you. My name's Gary. Uh, how'd you hear about our student ministry? What's your spiritual background? Did you grow up in church? You've just automatically launched into it. Students intuitively don't know how to do that. So you just give them a few simple scripts to start a conversation. A is ask questions. We teach six helpful diagnostic questions that go from more informational to more personal. So a first question is, hey, what's your spiritual background? What was that like growing up? What's it like for you now? Um, another question is, uh, what do you think is most important in life? What do you feel like is the purpose of life? It's a question you can ask an atheist, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a Christian. 
do you believe in God? How do you think we should relate to God? Um, we would ask, uh, do, do you believe in heaven? What do you think on the other side when we die? How sure are you on a scale of one to 10 that you'll get there? For a lot of lost students, you or your student may be the first person who's ever asked them deep questions about their soul. And it shows not that you're trying to force information on them, but that you care about them and you're trying to draw it out of them. See, one of the things your students are terrified of is saying the wrong thing and being seen as pushy. Well, people's favorite topic of conversation is themselves. So if you're asking people about themselves, what's important to you? What do you believe? People feel appreciated. They feel respected and they're willing to have those conversations. So teach that skill of asking questions and listening to answers. Um, I started college as an engineer. I work at a school with engineers. I have to coach students on things like make eye contact, smile and nod when people talk to you because engineers, we're not, fam we're not famous for our people skills. So just be a good active listener. When somebody shares with you, ask a follow-up question. Tell me what you meant by that. that. That's really interesting. Tell me more about blank. So just teach good listening skills and then tell the good news. This is where that gospel presentation you've learned comes into play. And then why is yes or no, ask for a response. See, early on, our, as our movement was getting started, we were sharing the gospel a lot, but we weren't seeing people get saved very often. And then we made a commitment. Every time we share the gospel, whether it's one-on-one -on -one, in a small group or a large group, we're going to ask people, do you want to follow Christ? How ready are you on a scale of one to 10? So youth, youth pastors, that may mean more often than you're doing. Give students in your group a chance to respond. We're meeting so many students on the college campus who know the gospel, but they've never been asked to respond when they were in church younger. So give your students a chance to respond. And so we ask everybody, are you ready to trust Christ? How ready are you on a scale of one to 10? Now, most people aren't ready yet, but some were. So as we started sharing a lot and asking everyone, do you want to trust Christ? Some of them started saying yes. And then my last point is you build culture by celebrating stories. One of the ways that this will spread in your ministry is by being it becoming it by celebrating great stories. Now, stories, great stories aren't conversion stories. Somebody going from lost to save, that's a great story. Great stories are about obedience. A student who risked it, initiated a spiritual conversation, brought up Christ with a friend. They swallowed their pride. They overcame their fear. They did that. Celebrate that. Tell that story. You know, let, let them say, I was terrified to share my faith. And I brought it up with my best friend from school that I'd never shared with before. And he's not ready to receive Christ yet. But I got to talk about it. And then everybody cheers and erupts. Um, one of the cool things about building a culture where you're telling these stories in our ministry, here's what we do is we have a smaller group where we have student leaders together every couple of weeks. We spend most of that time just having them share stories about their the Bible studies they lead, the, the, the ministries they're part of. We don't do a lot of business. We do a lot of storytelling because that builds culture. Um, and then in our large group meetings, every week we interview a student and just tell us your story. Tell us your story of how you came to Christ and tell us how you've been growing lately. That normalizes spiritual growth. It shows that obedience isn't for the exceptional varsity level Christian. It's for every Christian. Um, don't set those low expectations for students. Call them to a big vision and then celebrate every time they rise to that vision. Um, kind of the last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over for questions. One of the things your students struggle with is saying, I don't have what it takes. I can't do this. They struggle with fear. We love Matthew 4, 19, where Jesus says, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. We tend with that verse to emphasize the come follow me part, the let's be a disciple part, and the fishers of men part. I love the middle part the I will make you part. See, it's a promise that Jesus gives to us. He says, if you, your job is to follow me, 
And if you will devote yourself to obedience, to sold out obedience to me, I'll do the hard work in you to make you into an evangelist. I'll embolden you. I'll give you the skills you need. I'll give you the, your job is to follow me. So just point your students to Jesus, give them that big picture vision and see what God does from it. So that is what I have prepared, Paul, Shane, it's all yours now. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for everything you said, Gary. It was amazing. Uh, I took notes. We have them down here, and I'm sure uh, everyone else listening did as well. But we're going to transition now to the Q&A section. And so, Lacey, will you kick us off with the first question? And if you could also mention who it's from. Thanks. Let me unmute myself. There we go. Um, yeah, this is from this is kind of similar, all all within the prayer realm of your first point. So sorry if I say your name wrong. From Jamie and Andrew, they both asked about, hey, what does that prayer time look like? How do you lead students to pray intentionally on their own? Or is it better for them to just to to pray with a student leader who can actually initiate that strategy? What does that look like? Gary, let's have you start. And then Paul and Shane, if you want to jump in after and share your experiences with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Most of the time prayer, uh, people's only paradigm for praying is to pray, praying for personal needs. So we really need to teach students how to pray uh, scripture and to pray for the lost. Um, we have some, we, we've just found some simple resources. You could probably just find a prayer, a ministry you trust that has how to pray for an hour resources. Prayer's like a muscle and the more you use it, the stronger you get in it. The thought of praying for the loss for an hour for me used to be like, I, I couldn't imagine praying for more than five minutes for anything. Um, but teaching students to pray through passages of scripture and teaching them to make lists of lost students and praying those scripture over their friends is really powerful. Yeah, I would um, I would add, yeah, help them have a specific list of non-Christian friends that they're praying for every day and even keep them accountable to, to pray every day and in your discipleship groups or student leadership time, you say, hey, did you pray for your impact list every day this week? Like, And that's a question. And it's it's almost sounds legalistic. But we found that when someone is really intentional to genuinely pray over that list, they for one, their love for that person grows Two, they start to see more opportunities to share. And then we're seeing like, a ton of people saved from that method. It's like, all we did different was start praying. Uh, my buddy and I joined a CrossFit gym a little while back in Chico. And we started doing that. We started praying for the guys in the gym. And we made a goal that we were gonna, we wanted to see 20 people saved in the gym. And uh, actually, long story short, the gym owner went to my buddy, Brian, and said, I noticed you have a good relationship with God. I don't know if you help people with their, their relationship with God or not. And Brian's a pastor. So he said, yes, of course I do. Basically led the gym owner to Christ. And it was like, win the chief, win the tribe. We fast forward. We just saw our 25th person baptized at Chico Community Church. <laughs> and so be careful what you pray for, man. It's amazing. So that's an amazing kind of incredible out of the out of the ordinary prayer, like answer to prayer. But I, I don't know. I think we need to elevate even our expectation um, when we're praying for people. So that's some thoughts on prayer for sure. Yeah. And I love, Lacey, that Gary made such a big deal about prayer. First of all, Gary, that was stellar, man. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, but because we know prayer is the fuel for everything. Uh, my mentor used to say we should never talk to people about God until we talk to God about people. That prayer is the fuel for every aspect of ministry. And, and you know, and typically, you know, when I'm talking to leaders, I can go, hey, what's your evangelism strategy? And they'll go, it's this, this, and this. Or, hey, what's your discipleship strategy? It's this, this, and this. What's your leadership pipeline look like? They're like, it's this, this, and this. And then if you go, hey, what's your prayer strategy look like? You're like, oh, 
you know, we don't really have one. Um, and so what we did even at NAMM is we created one. Um, so Jason, if I still have the ability to share my screen, I'm gonna just go ahead and share this aspect. And we actually have a prayer strategy laid out that you can mobilize your students to pray through this every day, but you can also mobilize your leaders to pray, uh, maybe adults, um, that if you're in a local church context, to have your adults praying, the staff praying. And here's just an easy way to pray. Uh, for Gen Z, I always tell uh, adults, instead of complaining about students, start praying for students. Um, and so here's a simple way to do this. I'm going to share um, this graphic right here, if we can. And yeah, I think we can see this here. Um, all right, let's hit. Yeah, play from current slide. All right, there you go. All right. Yeah. At least he's making fun of my technical skills here. All no, right. no, you did great. All right. All right. Yeah. And so we laid this out. It's just prayers for Gen Z um, students. And, and we kind of use Gen Z as an acronym because, you know, us old dudes, we love acronyms. Um, but it's really just praying for growth. Pray that Gen Z would grow in love for Jesus. Um, e, engage. Pray that Gen Z would engage unbelievers with the gospel. N, navigate. Pray that Gen Z would navigate this world with God's uh, word, God's truth. Um, we know there's such an agenda being put um, on young people. So pray that they would navigate that with the truth of God's word. And then zeal. Pray that Gen Z would have a zeal for revival and spiritual awakening. You know, uh, Paul and I and our team, Lacey, Evan, Anna, so many others, is we say Gen Z for college students and older teenagers because we know that's what culture says and understands. But we uh, believe they're the revival generation. So we pray for revival. And it's currently a prayer request. But we think we're seeing sparks of reality of it that we pray turn into a raging inferno. So this is just a, a, a prayer strategy. So if you don't have one, this is one that you can incorporate. And then real quick, Paul, I can't believe you didn't talk about pray for Bob. That's like your favorite. You share that one all the time. So briefly <laughs> yeah. share about that because I think that's so convenient. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's super simple. And, you know, you can tell we love our acrostics around here, but it's <laughs> burden for the lost opportunity to witness and boldness to proclaim Christ. Yeah. Pray that every morning. Burden for the lost, opportunity to witness and boldness to proclaim the gospel. And let me warn you, uh, it's a dangerous prayer. If you start praying that every day, God will begin to stir in your heart and give you opportunities. And then when you have those opportunities, sometimes that boldness prayer is like, Lord, help me be bold in this moment. And uh, so that's, we train all our student leaders to pray that prayer every morning, those three things. And it is just amazing the difference that that, that one habit makes, actually. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, so that. good. that's so good. That's so good. Um, I'm going to move to our next question. It seems like we have a few minutes left. So let's try to uh, answer this quick. But the question is, it's from Anna Chromos, I think I said that right. She said, how do we teach students to celebrate when they don't always know how to or see why they should? Gary, I'll give you that to uh, to, to have you answer that for us. Thanks. Yeah. What, do you, what, what, is, what is behind that question? How do we teach students to celebrate? Yeah. So the, the question is, how do we teach students to celebrate when they don't always know how to or know necessarily why they should? Yeah, we, the way we love to celebrate is by just having students stand in front of other students and share great stories of obedience to Christ. And it could be simple, simple victory stories like I, I was struggling in this area, but I trusted God with it. Um, and then with evangelism, it could be it, it doesn't have to be I led my friend to Christ. It's just I started praying for my friend and I brought up Jesus with them last week. Mm. Um, and so every time we have students gathered, we do something to tell stories of people being faithful to Christ. Um, so the best way to tell the best way to build that culture is by telling stories, having students tell their own stories and or telling it about them. Man, I love that. Paul or Shane, you all have anything else to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I would just want to re-highlight <laughs> uh, what Gary said in his uh, presentation is um, I loved how you even used the example of celebrating um, a student sharing the gospel where the person didn't surrender to Jesus. Because I think a lot of times in our context, we just celebrate the story of, you know, getting in a gospel conversation at Starbucks uh, and, you know, and an atheist right there 
you know, hits their knees, you know, in the, in the midst of empty Starbucks cups, gives their life to Jesus. And then revival breaks out across the whole coffee shop. Like we'll like make videos of that, put that on social media. We'll even play that testimony in big church. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so like, Hey, I'm all for celebrate those, but I want to say, yeah. I love what Gary said, celebrate acts of obedience. Cause ultimately salvation's up to the Lord sharing the gospel and pointing people to Jesus is up to us through acts of faith and obedience. So I would say, yeah, celebrate stories, even where students are faithful at sharing the gospel and the person doesn't accept. And I think there's power in that because people, I think our students expect us to talk about that. But when they go, oh, hey, there's Lindsay. She's 16. She's in my small group. And if she can do it, I can do it. Oh, hey, there's John. He's 21. He's in my small group or, you know, he sits next to me in class. If he can do it, I can do it. And so I think there's just power in creating momentum when there's peer to peer stories. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to basically say the same thing. One thing is to almost lower the bar of what we celebrate. So, yes, we celebrate even full on gospel uh, presentations. But even if you just identify with Christ for the first time, in an affinity group. So someone's on an athletic team and for the first time they got up enough courage to let a, let the other guys know on the team that they're a follower of Christ. They can go back to their their discipleship group or their their uh student leadership team and they can say, "Hey, I finally got the courage to let everyone know I follow Jesus." And then everyone's like, "Yeah, that's awesome." And so or even some people it's just making a new friend in class. Like, hey, I made a new friend. I learned their name. I'm developing that. And so sometimes there is like a process. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing we want to celebrate is gospel conversations. Like see as a ministry, if you can track and celebrate how many gospel conversations that you had. There was a ministry in Arkansas. The name of their weekly meeting was 747. And they made a goal of having 747 gospel conversations in one year. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more Baptist than that, right? <laughs> Let's get some, you know, and we love that kind of stuff. But they, because they had the intentionality of having more gospel conversations than they would have before, they saw 40 students saved and baptized in one semester. And so it was just like this amazing movement of God. Because what I've discovered is there's a direct connection to how many people you share the gospel with and how many people you lead to Christ. <laughs> it's just crazy how it works. That the problem is not with the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The problem is a lack of laborers. And one thing that Gary and his team always says to their students is Jesus said the harvest is plentiful and Jesus tells the truth. Because just reminding students when they go out into the harvest, like the harvest is plentiful and Jesus tells the truth. And so that was one like, cultural thing that I remember them saying, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Another one their team would say is lost people don't know how to be saved. And that reminds you like, hey, most lost people under, they're kind of inoculated to the gospel. And when you share a true gospel message with them, that can open the blind eyes of the lost and they can be saved. So those are just a few thoughts there on that one. I love it. I love it. Lacey, will you go ahead and ask Eris question? I love it. Yeah, I would actually, yeah, but this is going to last question. I'm going to kind of combine the questions because I think they're in the same realm and I it's really interesting. So David and Eric, I'm going to combine your questions here. But how, let's say you're starting from ground zero as a ministry. Maybe you're really event-based, really event-focused, which takes a lot of time and energy, as I'm sure y'all know. Or maybe you're just starting a college ministry for the very first time. How would you, what are the, maybe first two or three things that you would tell somebody to do to either transition their ministry to be more evangelistic or just starting that ministry and they want to build that from the ground up. So let's just, yeah, maybe hone in on two or three things. Uh, Shane, do you want to kick us off and then Gary and Paul can jump in? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I know we keep going back to it. I know it may sound like a Sunday school answer, but it's so true. I would say start with prayer. Start with prayer walking your mission field, whatever that is, whether that's a college campus or around, you know, middle schools, high schools, your community. Um, just get out the building and start walking and praying and just saturate that area with prayer. Um, I would say the second thing um, is just get out where the people are. 
So just start if you go, hey, we don't have any college students or we don't have any teenagers. We'll start with uh, adults in your church that love teenagers and love college students and just go go where they are. Um, you know, uh, if you remember, you know, I think a lot of times we approach it to go, oh, we're going to build this ministry or build this building and then go invite the people to come. You know, it's like fill the dreams. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, hey, go out where they are. Because here's the deal is if, if you'll reach people, you'll build a ministry, right? If you if you reach people, you'll grow a ministry. So I think a lot of times we're trying to fix the ministry part first and then go, all right, then we'll go get them. Like, no, just go get out with with people, pray, point them to Jesus, um, and then your ministry will benefit from that. Yeah. Mm, good. Yeah, I would I would say anything you give attention to, you'll will improve. And so if the leader is brokenhearted for the lost and talks about the lost, whether you're building from scratch or you're trying to you're trying to change culture in a big ministry, if the leader talks about the urgency of eternity, the fact that heaven and hell are real, the fact that most people are headed on a path that'll leave them separated from God. The fact that we're ambassadors of Christ, like if the leader talks about values, those things, talks about those things, models, those things, then it, actually, if you're starting a ministry, it's a great time to get the right DNA from the beginning. That's even, that's probably easier than shifting a big ministry that's program driven already. But even if you've got, cause we were a big program driven ministry, we just started talking about it and people started saying, yeah, that's right. So we want to we want to shift because what you're saying is true. So talk about the gospel, the urgency of eternity, model it, and you'll shift the culture. It's great. Yeah, I would say one thing is don't throw out all events and all programs because God can really use events, large group preaching, uh, giving an invitation for students to accept Christ. And I feel like a ministry that's really healthy can be firing on all cylinders. They can have a really good weekly meeting that's with worship and preaching. And actually our student, if you have trained student leaders and volunteers that know how to share the gospel, they can use that, any of your social events or meetings or whatever, as fishing pools to set up gospel appointments, which is basically what it sounds like. It's just an appointment to share the gospel with every single student that attends one of your meetings. And so that was our goal. 10 minutes before the meeting, 10 minutes after, our team would make friends with, with students and say, hey, it'd be great to get to know you better and tell you more about what our group is all about. You want to grab lunch or coffee sometime? And if they're breathing, they need Jesus. <laughs> and when in doubt, share the gospel. And we would set up gospel appointments. Even if they had a Jesus Saves shirt on, we'll set up a gospel appointment with them and hear their story, share our story, share the gospel. And we even saw a lot of Christians come to Christ. <laughs> we saw a lot of people that grew up in church that had never truly repented of their sin and trusted in Christ and had someone clearly share the gospel and ask them, would you like to make Jesus Lord of your life right now? And then it's the hard work of personally discipling. So really, we want to do all of it. We want to do large group, we want to do small group. We want to do initiative evangelism. We want to be in every pocket of people in our community, every athletic team, every club, every nook and cranny of our communities. We want to saturate with the gospel. So that's kind of my philosophy is the best kind of evangelism is the kind that you do. So. <laughs> Wow, this has been, I know, such a really good conversation, and we hope everybody who's been listening feels really equipped. I know we've mentioned a lot of resources, and we've shared a lot of links. If you've lost any of those, just know if you go to jensen.org, you will find all of them. So you can just, if you just want to go to that one website, we have them under the leaders tab and under the students tab. We have tons of resources there. And of course, if you're not following us on social media, we share a lot of resources. We link a lot of resources. So you can follow us at Jensen on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. 
Uh, and again, subscribe to the podcast. We're talking a lot about that. I know we've talked about a lot of topics. And last final thing is the Jensen program. So if you are looking for something to send your college students to in the summer to grow that muscle, that evangelism muscle, to maybe just ignite something in them, that Jensen summer program is incredible for that. We also have trips throughout the year for student groups or even college ministries for fall break, spring break, things like that. And again, all of this is at Jensen. Jensen.org. So if you want to learn about the experience, if you want to find some resources, anything that we mentioned, it's all going to be on there. So I'm so excited about just what the fruit that's going to come from this. I truly believe that people are going to leave here excited and maybe even with some new plans for their ministries to um, mobilize their students. Evan, would you pray for these leaders um, as we sign off? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I feel led just super quick before we pray, just to share something super practical. I just graduated from Texas A&M University. And one evangelism strategy that we had was that we would have a poster sign and we'd sit on a bench on campus that just read free advice. And college students are the most open-minded people ever, sometimes to where our brain falls out on the floor sometimes. But we would just sit there and people would come up to us and they'd be like, what are you giving advice on? And we're like, literally anything. They're like, well, how does it work? They'd be like, ask us any question. We'll try our best to try to help you guys out. And it'd be as simple as where should I go for lunch all the way to, man, my bro, my boyfriend just broke up with me. He'd been dating for four years. What do I do? And so we try to avenue from those conversations as surface level or as deep as they were a conversation to the gospel. And we actually saw 18 people get saved doing that, just me and another uh, college buddy. And so that might have some inspiration or some creativity for you guys to do that throughout your campus. But um, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we love you so much, Lord, and we love your gospel. Uh, Lord, we pray, uh, Lord, that um, if we feel burdened, Lord, if if we feel, um, Lord, a lack of, desire, uh, Lord, to share your mission. Lord, if we feel burned out, uh, Lord, if we feel frustrated, Lord, that you just meet us right now where we're at, Lord, that this webinar, Lord, is just encouraging, Lord, and it's rejuvenating, Lord, that we can go back into our ministries, go back into our spaces, fueled and ready to reach people for your gospel. Lord, you do not lie, and you say that the harvest is plentiful. Lord, so we're going to pray the scary prayer, and we're going to ask that you send us, Lord, and that you send other harvesters into the harvest. Lord, that you equip us with your words, with your love, with your desire. Lord, that you bring hundreds of thousands of students into your kingdom through these people on the webinar, Lord. We are so thankful for the leadership of Paul and Shane and Gary, Lord. We praise your holy name, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for being on our webinar. We're so glad that uh, we were able to partner with you guys, and we'll see y'all next time, whether that be on the Jensen podcast or out and about. We'll see you guys later.